Hello um, and welcome everybody to our uh, second installment of the SOAS Economics Summer Lecture Series. And I was just uh, telling Sophie and Fuad uh, earlier that actually now we can call it the Summer Series as the summer has finally arrived in London. Um, and we are even more happier than, um, than before now to have you uh, in here despite the nice weather. So um, welcome everybody. Let me also welcome uh, Fuad and, and Sophie. Um, Sophie is a, a lecturer here at SOAS in economics um, and a dear colleague. From, we, we also just talked about how long we've known each other, um, uh, did our PhDs more or less at the same time in the economics department and are now colleagues um, at the department. Um, uh, we also have Fuad Mohammed uh, Abu Bakar, who works for the Cocoa Marketing Company GH Limited in Ghana and is joined uh, and is joining us today from the Western region of Ghana. So welcome Fuad. Uh, let me just qu quickly also share my screen with you guys. I hope you can see that. Um, now just trying to, there you go. So this is the second, as I said before, the second lecture in our Source Economics Summer Lecture ser Series that is organized by myself and my colleague, Sara Stevano. Um, and today's uh, lecture uh, by Sophie and Fuad is on the um, Ghana, uh, on, on, the, on the cocoa industry in Ghana. Uh, more specifically, the, the, uh, Fuad and Sophie asked the question, why Ghana doesn't get the full value of its cocoa beans, um, uh, providing us with a, with a analysis of, uh, of, the, um, of global value chains and in general of the insertion of the cocoa industry in, uh, into global value chains and what uh, can be actually changed for Ghana to get more value for its coca production, I imagine. But um, let's, uh, let's find out from Sophie and Fuad themselves. They've also published uh, um, on their, their research in the European Journal of Development Research. Um, um, in which they, they present their findings. So I will share a link to that uh, special issue article um, in the chat box in a, in, a, in a little bit. And they also published, um, um, on the back of these findings, published a uh, article in the conversation with the very same question that um, is asked today in this lecture. So I will also share that. Um, the way in which these lecture series are organized, um, so after this introduction, Sophie and Fuad have about 45 minutes to, uh, to present their papers and their findings. Um, within these 45 minutes, you can already start asking your questions or leaving comments in the chat box. These questions and comments I will collect uh, and then put to the two presenters after they finished with their lecture. Um, and that they can, they can respond directly to these questions. Um, and um, if you will, then again, you can, you can respond in the chat box again to their responses. So please feel free to already start as soon as, as, as you have a question coming into your mind or a comment um, that is provoked by something that um, Sophie of Fuad says, just feel free to, um, to, to put your comment or question in the chat box. Um, so yes, I think uh, this is it. Um, just a quick um, heads up, this, record, uh, this meeting is being recorded. It is also streamed on Facebook. Um, um, we will share the Facebook stream with you in the chat box so you can share it widely with a family who might not have Zoom and then can also have access to this lecture. Um, and I think this is it from my side. Um, so without further ado, let me pass it on to Sophie and Fuad um, who will um, present their findings. Thank you to Piers for this very kind introduction and Sarah and to Piers for inviting us. Um, we're very happy to be here and also thank you all um, for joining us today as to be a set despite uh, the very nice weather. Let me share my screen to have you see our PowerPoint presentation. Okay, 
So as Tabia said, um, we posed the question why Ghana doesn't have the full value of its cocoa bean um, and how could this change? We look at um, the cocoa chocolate sector as a whole rather than just focusing on cocoa beans. The presentation, I will do the first half of the presentation and food will take over the second half. We have four different parts. Um, first, a very quick introduction um, of our research question and analytical focus. We then go into um, a very brief overview of the literature on financialized food systems. Um, and then um, move, I will move into the cocoa chocolate sector more generally. And Fuert will then talk about Ghana's cocoa chocolate sector and will conclude with policy discussions. As to be a said, at any point, please post your questions in the, uh, in the chat function and we will respond to them at the end. Um, the presentation is um, based on a paper that has been published in a special issue by the European Journal of Development Research. The special issue was edited by Antonio Andreoni and ha Chang Chang on, the, um, on um, putting production back into development um, on the about development agenda. Um, and the paper has a maybe less catchy title and um, is called Potentials for Upgrading in Financialized Agri-Food Chains, the case of Ghanaian cocoa. The, um, to just give you some context um, within which we locate our research, the global chocolate industry is worth broadly 150 billion US dollars. West Africa, that is to say Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana and Nigeria, supplies 70% of all cocoa beans globally. Cocoa beans, of course, are the primary input factor in the chocolate production process. However, the West African economy receives less than 7% of that 150 US dollar, uh, billion US dollars worth of industry. Most of the value added um, in that sector or the value in a chocolate bar that you will um, consume is generated in Europe and North America. And this is despite um, a fast growing demand um, for chocolate on the, uh, on the African continent, which however is dominantly met through um, imports from outside. So you're posing the question, what hinders so-called fun functional upgrading? So functional upgrading is the move into higher value added segments of a value chain. That's our research question. Um, there are different angles you can take to that particular research question and we're not claiming exclusivity in the sense that we're answering each and every dimension of it. However, the angle that we focus on is that we're looking at upgrading opportunities in the context of financialized food systems. Um, and when we say financialization, we, um, we investigate the financialization forces or how financialization might affect upgrading opportunities from two different um, angles. The first one is financialization at the level of the global cocoa chocolate sector as a whole, and in particular financialization of lead firms. So that's very much in the shareholder doctrine tradition. And that's something that I will discuss um, in section number three of this presentation. Um, the second part that we look at, which complements this first um, angle that we take, is financialization at the level of globalized finance. And this particularly becomes relevant when you talk about the particular case of Ghana. Um, and this is um, how globalized finance does affect um, a small open economy such as, um, as Ghana. Um, the hypothesis we put forward are twofold. Um, so we claim that financialization does act as limiting factor. However, there's contradicting tendencies. So that means it both pushes for, um, towards upgrading, but then constrains upgrading in important ways. So financialization of the, at the level of the sector, so from the GVC lead firm type of perspective, um, has promoted um, outsourcing of non -core, so called non core activities. Um, and that has promoted to some extent a value addition in um, commodity producing economies, including Ghana, to some certain extent, so to kind of a middle value semi processed um, stage. But at the same time, financialization has also contributed to the consolidation of power at the elite firm segments, which does hinder and prevent further upgrading, um, functional upgrading towards the actual production of chocolate. Um, at the level of globalized finance, we observe that the particular dependency of Ghana um, and other um, primary commodity exporting economies um, on cocoa um, or primary commodities in general um, um, exports for foreign exchange earnings makes them very, very um, uh, 
um, vulnerable to external shocks. So you, the challenges that are associated with commodity dependencies are widely known, and it's quite difficult to manage your macroeconomy as commodity prices are um, very volatile. So that makes um, upgrading or diversification into the higher value added processing stage um, more, even more necessary or urgent. However, that same dependency on the cocoa exports for foreign exchange also undermines some of the feasible upgrading strategies that are often proposed in the literature, which do or would focus more on the domestic or regional markets first. See, so we, we pose the question of whether this actually constitutes a uh, middle value added trap where Ghana is being trapped at a position where it is able to move um, up towards semi-processed um, cocoa beans, but doesn't or isn't able to really kind of move in an international competitive stage for its um, chocolate industry. Um, and uh, the answer to this, there's a risk of it, but it can be overcome. So just as a spoiler um, towards the end, as Stuart will explain to you um, later. Um, the first part um, of our analysis is very much located within two important literatures. The first one um, is uh, borrowed from the global value chain tradition. But in particular, um, that married with the, um, the shareholder value doctrine, which is something that hasn't or didn't come out of the global value chain tradition, but is increasingly recognized as a driving force of shaping, shaping global agri food chains. And here again, um, as we said uh, just before, there's a growing tendency of food multinationals to outsource so called lower value added, these are kind of semi finished uh, product um, um, activities. And um, at the same time, we have an increase in concentration um, at, the, uh, that, at the lead segment. Um, the other tradition we, uh, we built on is the food systems tradition, where some of the authors have observed or proclaimed a new arrival, the arrival of a new financialized food regime, um, in which the distinction between um, those um, financial actors that are um, historically or traditionally act only in the financial sphere and those um, who are um, actually involved in the production and processing of food, so the non-financial corporations, is increasingly blurry. So there's an increasing overlap um, across the different activities that um, these companies do or engage with. So how does that play out? And this is a very brief overview um, of the literature. Um, so at the level of non-financial actors, we observe that there is financialization of both of all three elements, which is objectives, investment, and also operations. The first um, objectives and investment is something that is very much linked and associated with the shareholder value doctrine. Financialization of objectives is something that has been observed more in the food system uh, tradition. Now, we observe the first two they are very much prominent across three lead segments um, across different uh, food value chains, which are here stereotypically called first tier suppliers, which are everything that ranges from trading houses to processors, all the way to branders. So these are the, uh, the big brand names and then to retailers. Um, financialization of objectives uh, does summarize kind of the tendencies of offshoring, outsourcing, so all of these different strategies that um, do boost um, the so-called so rock, which is the return on capital investment. Um, in order to please shareholders, then we have um, financialization of investments. So that is the observation that different companies are increasingly engaging in share buybacks. That's the, the tradition that is predominantly observed for US-based companies. Um, and also that grows in a different um, lead firm segment over the past decades have taken primarily uh, place through mergers and acquisitions rather than investment in productive activities. Um, on the first is supply and retailer um, segments, we also observe financialization of, of operations, and that now reaches into the realm of a blurred uh, the lines between financial and non-financial corporations being increasingly blurry um, in the food systems, which uh, means that first suppliers do now count um, some first suppliers count hedge funds and other financial institutions such as banks among their own subsidiaries. And both first year suppliers and retailers offer financial services to their clients that could um, include everything from insurance risk management to credit provisions. Um, and that could, these clients could, of course, be consumers as well as other um, actors in the food system. Um, so this is just a visualization of um, how interlinked um, these different segments have become. Um, and it looks quite cluttered, but um, 
I think that in itself tells you um, how closely related these different um, stakeholders are now in their activities. Um, some of these linkages are very old and reach back to basically the origins of these uh, value chains. Um, some are more recently uh, have more recently been established. Um, first, the suppliers, which are, again are trading houses and major processes, um, have always been heavily engaged in um, the trading of derivatives um, in order to manage their both their price and also their quant quantity risk. Now, the, their counterpart is that these derivatives markets, so that commodity futures markets, commodity options markets, um, their counterparties are usually in the, now nowadays index funds, um, investment banks and hedge funds and other financial um, traders who also trading or taking the other side of these services um, buying and selling them. Um, at the same time, first tier, tier suppliers are also repackaging these services in order to offer insurance products um, to other lead segments, which are mainly the branders and the retailers. So they offer these as services to their own clients, which are the branders and the retailers. Now, on the um, on the other hand, we have both all three lead segments. So first tier suppliers, branders and retailers um, engaging heavily in uh, both trading, so selling of debt, so if corporate bonds, and also um, if they are listed on the exchanges, um, then um, equity. Now, um, the equity as well as the corporate bonds is being heavily invested in by, again, investment banks, hedge funds, and um, also private equity funds. At the same time, we have um, investment bank hedge funds and private equity funds being shareholder, major shareholders of firstly suppliers, bonders and retailers. And at the same time, firstly suppliers are now accounting as some of their subsidiaries, hedge funds and also private equity funds um, among their portfolio of, uh, so they have diversified into these segments. Private equity funds are usually used by first tier suppliers in order to, to engage in land grabbing activities, um, and often this can be quite opaque. So there are a couple of um, courses you've tried uh, to trace this uh, this down. Um, on the, um, the financial access side, we have index funds and hedge funds who now invest or have started in the early 2000s um, to heavily invest in any sort of, of food-based derivative in instruments, and that even spans um, elements such as weather, food, fuel, um, fertilizer, as well as farmland, both driven by a very uh, low yield um, and interest rate environment. Um, at the same time, commodity derivatives at some uh, points so in the early 2000s were advertised as being a good hedge against inflation. So there was it was a double win um, for these uh, more institutional investors as well as the active ones. Um, and um, also there is kind of a reoccurring narrative of having a commodity super cycle, food shortages, um, a part of this being driven by um, climate change. And that, of course, uh, makes the prospects of rising prices um, loom on the horizon very prominently and encourages these investors uh, to invest in all of these uh, food related derivatives. Um, now, we also see um, hedge funds who invest heavily in, in equity or in food based equity, and they repackage these products um, now um, in, in, in form of indices and sell them on um, to clients. Most prominently, or the biggest hedge funds in that business is BlackRock, um, and commodities in general or food based uh, companies um, are becoming a prominent part of any wealth manager's portfolios. At the same time, we have the first tier suppliers who are owning some of the hedge funds who are then exploiting their experience and their capabilities in both trading derivatives as well as dealing with actual physical commodity in terms of storage. Now, some of these activities have been made less profitable in 2016 because there were some regulations against insider trading, which is something that wasn't prohibited um, on, for commodity markets for, well, until then. Um, and uh, so regulators have kind of curtailed some of these activities. In the early 2000s, we also saw investment banks who heavily invested uh, both in um, indices as well as um, actual physical commodity. Most of these activities were abandoned um, by investment banks. Um, so they um, now only focus on the derivative trading and uh, equities. Um, so uh, just to kind of uh, a slightly less cluttered uh, picture, which uh, gives a summary of the in involvement of these uh, financial um, actors in the um, actual goods market, which here is based on um, the selling and um, trading of crops. 
Um, and again, so that element um, has been reduced uh, quite a bit and the other entanglement has been um, summarized by the previous picture. Now, how does it, how does all of this look um, for the cocoa chocolate sector and what are the implications of it? So what I presented previously is very much a summary of different types of literatures um, brought together um, into these uh, two uh, stylized um, graphics, if you want. Um, we looked at the cocoa chocolate or the chocolate industry um, in particular, and the conclusion there has to be that actually all of these different dynamics are playing out exactly as they're playing out in other food uh, systems. Um, so we see that uh, shareholder payouts have increased quite steadily um, since the 2000s or the 1990s, and that um, the level of shareholder payouts is um, po very positively correlated with institutional investors. So the more institutional investors are holding shares of, uh, of a food-based company, the higher the shareholder payouts um, there are. Um, so that's very much the shareholder value doctrine. Um, most companies um, have now acquired multiple subsidiaries, um, which are mainly managed via different holding companies, often registered in um, tax havens. And uh, while branders have accumulated mainly other brands, so they have kind of this has been a more or less a horizontal um, uh, concentration, um, when they have diversified maybe in different product groups. Um, first tier suppliers, on the other hand, have diversified into all sorts of different activities um, and also quite vertically, now um, including um, elements of marketing, transport, storage, sourcing, trading and agriculture service provision. So they are now active across the whole um, upstream of um, the food chain and here also the chocolate cocoa chain. Um, so that means um, the, these uh, first year suppliers are heavily vertically integrated, which also means they have an in information advantage when they trade or risk, uh, manage their risk. Some of that trading is speculative, some of it is for insurance purposes, um, and they do benefit um, from, um, from um, having um, premium information by that vertical, through that vertical integration. Um, this is a, just a brief summary of um, the main branders and first tier suppliers in the case of chocolate. Um, so Mars is the largest, Mondelez, Hershey, um, on the brander segment and first tier suppliers, starting with Cargill, which of course is not only dominant in uh, chocolate and cocoa, but also in grain trade, more general, also Barry, same story, and so on and so forth. What you can see here, so there are a couple of uh, conclusions to draw from. Not all of them, of course, are listed. Those that are listed have um that's the first kind of first couple of uh, columns here um we see a larger share um or a percentage of dividends um being paid out as a percentage of uh, gross profits and um that uh, the higher the share of institutional investors in the um, entire portfolio of shareholders that hold the shares of these companies, um, the higher the uh, percentage of dividends being paid. And we see that they're quite important regional differences. So US-based companies um, tend to have um, a much higher um, in, uh, share of institutional investors in their shareholder portfolio than companies uh, listed elsewhere. And that's something that's being observed across different sectors. Um, in the financialization literature. We can also see um, that these companies have been heavily engaged in um, buying or mergers and acquisitions um, and counting for Mondelez and Nestle um, um, up to 200 subsidiaries. So these are the ones that I could find. There might uh, well be, um, be more. Um, now, what uh, now financialization of, um, of or how does this story look like from the perspective of financial actors? Um, so that's the, the counter side. Now we looked at the how financialization of non-financial actors has taken place. Now we see our financial actors become more involved in the actual cocoa and chocolate industry. Um, the first is that the inf uh, through the information advantage of uh, first year suppliers. Um, However, this, this information advantage is increasingly undermined by something called index investors. Index investors are largely passive investors, so they're betting on uh, mainly rising prices in the long run, and they investing in commodities irrespective of that particular commodity. So they're just investing in the basket. They're not reacting to any uh, sort of market insights or market information. 
um, and they have been um, accused of undermining price discovery in commodity markets and other speculative uh, uh, oriented traders have been accused of the same thing. Um, at the same time, we have seen um, bouts of a rising volatility and again, some of this has been associated with the entrance of um, non-traditional financial investors in commodity derivatives and commodity futures. Um, and that has made the macroeconomic management of commodity dependent economies ever more difficult. Um, in the cocoa sector in particular, we had various attempts of um, hedge funds to corner the market, most infamously Amajaro or um, Chalk Finger, Anthony Ward, um, who was an infamous, oh, well, he still is, infamous hedge funds manager in soft commodities mainly. Um, and he's also the owner so, uh, of um, Amajaro, which is one of the, was until recently, um, a large uh, cocoa trading house. Um, he tried to corner the market that went sideways. Um, I think it was the second or third cornering attempt. And in 2014, um, he had to sell his physical um, trading business. However, these uh, things uh, do happen um, every now and then. Um, this is just a summary of just to show you how much additional financial interest has been channeled into um, cocoa derivatives or cocoa uh, futures. Um, so on the left hand side, we see the total open interest. So that's basically all the contracts that are being traded um, at, a, at the exchange, the um, ICE, ICE futures exchange here um, that are cocoa based. And um, the line shows you what is the share of index traders um, in, that, uh, in that group when we see that uh, these days is up to 30% of all the actors in that market are index based. On the right hand side, we see that there's increasing divergence between the growth in actual cocoa bean production, which is the dashed line, and um, open interest again, the amount of cocoa that is being traded on exchanges, and from the from the 1990s, but especially from the early 2000s, that has diverted, uh, started to di divert quite uh, dramatically, with some interruption around the uh, great financial global financial crisis. Now, what are the implications of this? Um, increasing horizontal concentration at uh, all league, league segments, um, also increasing vertical integration of first-year suppliers, or in the cocoa context called grinders. So these are the ones that uh, process uh, um, the cocoa beans, the raw cocoa beans, um, which has increased um, uh, across or upstream the value chains, um, all elements of control by these uh, main actors. Um, we also see that only two companies are now controlling um, half of the world's grinding business, which is uh, Cargill and Barry Callabout, which is a high level of concentration. And uh, competition in both the grinder and grinder segment relies very heavily on access to international financial markets, very heavily on financial activities rather than productive activities or a mix of both. Um, also, cocoa revenues are becoming increasingly volatile and they're different episodes, sometimes they're less so, sometimes more, but they tend to become more volatile, which um, makes export diversification ever more so imperative. Um, however, so at the same time, that financialization has led to grinders, um, has led grinders to outsource some of their um, processing activities, so some of this has been established in uh, countries where cocoa beans are actually also being grown, such as Ghana, but at the same time, that higher level of concentration are now firmly, so these doors are firmly shut, both because um, competition is being constrained by that level of concentration, but also because um, companies, outsider companies, have less of an access to these international financial markets, which are now very much um, essential in order to compete. So that's the implication of the uh, financialization of the cocoa chocolate sector on the global level. Now I'm handing over to Fuad, who's going, going to talk you through um, the Ghanaian um, cocoa uh, sector more, uh, more carefully. Fuad, are you here? Yes, over to you. Um, yes, Sophie, uh, thanks so much for the beautiful presentation. Well, I took over from the um, chapter four, where we take the Ghana's cocoa chocolate sector as a case. Now, situating Ghana within the um, SPA producers in West Africa, um, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, um, West Central Africa um, with Cameroon, and even Ecuador. 
Ghana is the only country without a fully liberalized cocoa sector, um, whereas in Cote d'Ivoire is kind of liberalized. Um, in Nigeria, Cameroon fully liberalized with some export taxes. Ghana has um, a sole seller, which is the cocoa marketing um, company, a subsidiary of the regulator um, Ghana Cocoa Board. However, the domestic sourcing from farm farmers has been delegated to licensed buying companies. Previously, it used also to be a monopoly of, um, of Cocoa Board. But um, after the liberalization as part of um, World Bank Structural Adjustment Program, 1992-93, private engagement um, was welcome. So these license buying companies buy from the farmers and deliver to CMC at a commission. Within this group, um, there are multinational companies. Um, Kaggle operates both um, as a grinder and um, as a primary buyer of cocoa. Barry does same. I mean, Olam does same as well. And as Sophie mentioned earlier, this gives them um, an advantage in terms of getting access to information on the crop performance and, again, informs their marketing strategy within the financialized sector. CMC deploys or practices a forward selling system which enables Cocoa Board to raise financing largely offshore with a group of syndicated banks to enable it to um, buy cocoa from farmers. I will highlight on this point because the capital requirements on annual basis is in excess of two billion US dollars. And this affords the Bank of Ghana to get access to cheaper US dollar loans. Again, this gives an advantage to other businesses to access financing from the commercial bank. If Cocoa Board or CMC was going to raise these funds locally, it will lead to liquidity crunch on the domestic um, financing sector. Yeah, Sophie, let's proceed. Sophie, the next slide. Okay, so this summarizes the forward selling strategy where uh, maybe I have to start from the, where we, the previous slide, which talks about the syndicated loan now, the syndicated loan, as I mentioned, is by a group of um, banks largely in Europe. Often we do have some local banks with um, foreign participation. I think we have the Standard Bank participating, Standard Bank of, um, of South Africa also participating in some years. Now, this loan is then extended to the buying companies to finance their sourcing operations from the farmers. Okay, that's fine, Sophie. So um, instead of these buying companies sourcing from the domestic banking sector, which attracts a higher rate, the Cocoa Board or CMC, because it borrows at a much relatively cheaper rate, get out as loans, often at prime rates. So if the prime rate for the Bank of Ghana, which is Ghana's central bank, is at 14%, then Cocoa Board will extend it at 14 or 15% compared to about 30 32% um, that they could have gotten from the commercial banks. Now, before Cocoa Board can raise these offshore loans, it needs to use forward selling contracts or forward sales contract as collateral to get these loans. Um, today being 2nd of June, 2021, if I'm to be on this trading desk selling, I'll be selling crop against um, the 2021-2022 crop. So I could be selling crop of June 2022. Now, Cocoa Board can meet its high funding requirement of Cocoa purchases through this um, offshore financing. Again, as I mentioned, it relieved the banking sector, the domestic banking industry from liquidity crunch. Since its inception in 1992 um, Cocoa Board has raised in excess of $25 billion so far. I think the highest rates rarely goes beyond um, 3% compared to age 13% if it were to borrow locally. Now, the cost to that is, as I mentioned, the forward selling done by CMC. So this limits CMC's negotiating position. Um, as Sophie explained, the highly financialized um, grinders and hedge funds are able to 
kind of forecast, okay, when is CMC going to be in the market? How much has CMC sold or how many tons has CMC sold so far? And how much are they expected to sell before the next indicated loan? So it's a bit um, an easy guess for most of these players. Now they can use that to, to, to enhance their market entry and exit strategy. Again, because of its, the Bank of Ghana's heavy reliance on cocoa revenue, there's a lot of um, politicization risk. Um, so for example, when you say um, the cocoa board forecast that the crop is gonna be a bit lower, what it means is that um, the financing that cocoa board is gonna go for should be lower. But again, the financing, even though it's primarily for the sourcing of cocoa beans from farmers, it plays a major role in currency stabilization for the Bank of Ghana, which is Ghana's central bank. Um, again, the use of standardized contracts, Sophie showed a chart of um, annual outputs and open interests on the now ICE cocoa futures. Both Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire or producing countries reference the ICE previously live as the price recovery tool for physical cocoa. And we do know that ICE has participants which are physical traders as well as um, speculative traders. And the charts um, earlier showed the increasing participation or dominance of speculative traders since the, 19, uh, since the 2008 financial crisis because cocoa kind of stood out um, as a good performing commodity despite the, the credit crunch. And again, um, the cable that's the GBP, um, British pound and the USD or pound sterling and the USD interchange it's risk. I recollect um, on the, I mean, June, same period when the Brexit vote was done, I mean, we saw a huge drop in the cable. Ghana had no role in it, but then the consequence was in Ghana because the gross revenue then has to go down if the cable is down. The next slide, Sophie. Wood, I think you're seeing the slides with the lag. Sophie, let's have the next slide. Um, I already brought it up, but I think you see it with the lag. Wood, you still there? Hmm. You might have lost Ford. Yeah, Sophie, I think he has had some problems coming in and out of the session, so you might yeah. have to... It's fine. Maybe I, I slowly continue, and yeah. um, when he comes back, then he... Yeah. Okay, let me continue. Tobias, can you okay, just let I'm me know? Do, Sophie, it's possibly ah, open up my... Um, you can proceed with yours, but I'm going to open... Yeah, when if you open your slides in parallel, because you're going to have a yeah, lag. Sophie, can you hear me? I can hear you. No, no, no. I'm not, I'm not going to share. I'm not going to share. I'm not going to share my slide. Okay. We are on slide 19 um, okay. now. So on slide 18. 19. Is that fine? Should I go back to 18? Okay, that's fine. So, okay, right. So then um, we look at the domestic value addition. The government of Ghana, or the... no, that's fine. 19 is fine. It's fine, can I proceed? Yes, you can. We are 19 now, sorry. Okay, that's fine. So we look at um, the domestic value addition or the processing sector. Almost all the companies within the Ghana's um, cocoa processing sector operate within the export um, 
zone where certain kind of incentives are extended to them. One has to do with the bean count, bean discounts extended to these companies. So bean count um, above 120 bean count um, per 100 gram goes at a discount of 20%. And as they, that means the smaller the bean, then the higher the discount that is extended to these guys. Now you compare this 20% discount to about 8% discount if they were to buy these beans um, elsewhere or in, on the international market. In effect, the Ghana government and Cocoa Board extend about 12% discount on the cost of beans for these guys to establish um, a factory locally. An additional um, incentive is the export free zone, which gives them tax exemptions on, um, on import of raw material, on machinery and others. And again, they are allowed to repatriate 100% of, of profit. Now these incentives are extended to these com the companies who are obliged to export minimum 70% of their output. However, Cocoa Board operates um, or CMC operates a balance sheet um, in USD. So the sales of cocoa beans, be it to, for export markets or the domestic processing market is in USD. This ideally should have been a, um, um, a challenge or obstacle to these processing or domestic processing factories. But surprisingly, domestic value addition has dominantly been, dri by, been driven by the, by the indigenous companies. Um, none of the multinational companies, um, be it the top three, Cargill, Barry Calibo, Olam, which bought over the um, ADM plant, none of them does tertiary processing. So they all do up to, I think, um, butter and cake. It is the indigenous Ghanaian companies who do up to um, consumables, as in um, chocolate and other beverages. So if you are moving to the next slide, okay. Um, so they, the chart shows how processing has evolved over the past few years. And I must um, mention, I think the highest processing we have seen was 320,000 tons in 2019, yeah, 2019-20. Now this compares with an installed capacity of over 500,000 tons. Now it implies that there's an excess processing gap of about 120,000 tons. And I must mention that this gap is largely by domestic companies or domestic processing companies because access to relatively cheaper funding is a bit of a challenge. So you have um, almost all the multinationals operating at full capacity, but the domestic companies or processing companies operating below capacity. So for you to the next slide. Okay, so within the domestic companies, we have Cocoa Processing Company, which is um, CPC, that's is noted or reputed for the Golden Tree chocolate brand. It has been in existence since 1965 and um, has a variety of um, cocoa products from chocolate, um, chocolate pastes, um, as in spread, um, as well as some, some beverages. Um, then we have niche cocoa, so CPC or the Cocoa Processing Limited is the is Ghana's biggest um, chocolate producer. Then we have Niche, which is a purely private um, company, also established in 20, 2007. Started initially only doing pro primary processing um, in liquor, but has extended to chocolates, which is um, a favorite of many within the within the Ghanaian um, Ghanaian market. They also process butter as um, as well. Then we have Plot Enterprise, which was established in 2009. It produces um, up to a secondary level. By secondary, I mean um, going beyond just liquor into butter and cake. 
Um, beyond these um, three, there are a plethora of um, small scale artisanal chocolate makers. And I must mention there's a joint venture between a German investor and the Ghana Cocoa Board. That was the first factory, cocoa processing factory established in Ghana. They also process up to the cake level. Now, beyond all these four that I have mentioned, um, these guys operate within the export zones. There are a number of small scale artisanal chocolate makers and the chocolate that they are producing is, is amazing. I must say that um, when you process locally, you are likely to have more cocoa content in it um, than what you, what you find somewhere in Europe or North America, which is dominated by um, milk and sugar. So we're proud to say that um, domestic artisanal chocolates process a lot of chocolate um, with high cocoa content in it. Now, despite this apparent success by these grinders and small scale chocolate manufacturers, growth in this area has been, has been a bit of a challenge. Um, we've seen a high level of indebtedness by some of these companies um, to CMC, um, largely because, of, um, because they are competing with highly financialized grinders. And again, and again, because most of these guys lack the expertise to manage their risk. Because even though you are a processor, you are buying beans, which, which can, you can easily hedge against the, the futures market, but the product doesn't have a market for you to, to hedge against um, price risk. So it's a bit of a challenge for these guys compared to the multinational companies who are highly financialized. They have the expertise for, for some of these things. Again, because most of these small scale chocolate manufacturers are not operating within the export zone, they don't benefit from those tax incentives. And unfortunately, because the export zone was primarily to enhance exports so as to raise foreign exchange for the, for the country or to relieve the central bank of um, foreign exchange pressures, whenever a player within the export zone is selling within the domestic market. So for example, if, um, if Plot Enterprise processes liquor and wants to sell it or butter and wants to sell it to an artisanal chocolate maker, it attracts a tax of about 60%, which is really crippling. Coupled with the fact that these guys, um, if, even if they are importing small scale um, machinery, then they pay taxes on it. They pay taxes on import of, um, of sugar as well as import of milk. So it's a bit of a challenge, even though they do have the capacity to, to process, to serve the Ghanaian market as well as the West African market. Now we look at the policy conclusions. So looking at the um, the global sector, looking at the Ghanaian cocoa case, what are the policy recommendations or policy conclusions? The key constraints has been that um, Ghana cocoa beans remain the most important source of foreign exchange or foreign reserves for the Bank of Ghana because investors within the gold and oil sectors are largely dominated by by multinational firms. Um, the, the shareholding of the Ghana government in these sectors, i.e. gold and oil, is, quite, is relatively low. And again, as I mentioned, because of the um, permissibility for these players to repatriate their revenue, I mean, definitely it takes a hit on the, on the Bank of Ghana's foreign reserve management. Now, another constraint is um, if the CMC is going to sell less of unprocessed cocoa beans forward, it implies that the collateral for borrowing is going to be challenged. But we do have um, a solution to remedy this, um, this situation. Because what it means is that if CMC is going to sell fewer volumes forward to get contracts for the offshore financing, it implies that the, the Bank of Ghana or the central bank is going to get lesser foreign exchange to, for, for currency stabilization as well as um, 
foreign reserve management. Upgrading strategies um, must include a system in which cocoa beans are sold to the local factories with lower balance sheets and lower credit ratings. In one of the charts that I showed, so some of these domestic processing companies um, are not, their contracts are not acceptable by some European banks in this, um, in this financing structure, largely because um, they don't have the requisite credit ratings for them to be, to be accepted in there. So we have a way of managing these contracts as well, what we call the non-syndicated um, group. Increasingly, we've seen that most of the banks are relaxing their requirements to allow some of these guys in. And often the challenge is that some of these banks do not have a clear understanding of, um, of the cocoa sector because of its Ghana's uniqueness. When you compare the risk levels in Ivory Coast, in Nigeria, I mean, it's exceptionally higher compared to the risk level um, in Ghana. But increasingly, we're having um, these companies or these banks accepting contracts from some local companies as part of the um, collateral. As a result, um, we believe that incentives for domestic processing, which are firmly targeted at preserving exchange rate returns, present um, the middle value added trap, as Sophie showed, um, showed earlier. Sophie, can you move to the next slide I have? Where we look at the, the ways forward. I already moved. I think it's just showing uh, for you okay. with the lag. So recommending the way forward, um, we recommend a system that preserve the foreign exchange earnings Okay, that's fine. Thanks so much. Okay, so we recommend a system that preserves the foreign exchange role that Cocoa plays, as well as um, a fully supportive approach for domestic processing um, sector. I of um, previous discussions, one of the maybe when we get to the next slide, I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, there are proposals that, okay, can we look at a long-term financing, maybe a bond, 10-20 um, year bond, which gives Cocoa Board access to 2 billion or 3 billion for year one. Cocoa Board can use that for sourcing or partly for, for sourcing, but in subsequent years, it will gradually relieve itself from relying on this um, offshore financing. And forget not, um, cocoa board receivables are in USD. So an approach where we relieve our CMC cocoa board release itself from the annual, um, from the offshore financing will give the Bank of Ghana much flexibility on how it manages its, um, its foreign reserve. Again, um, the domestic or regional markets are key for for the chocolate industry um, before the African continental free trade area. One argument that one could have made is that as the government of Ghana and the private sector increasingly add value to Ghana's cocoa, um, be it for the domestic or for the export market, there could be challenge with, um, in, with respect to tariff escalation where the more primary products um, products you, you export, is, um, that there are tax incentives there, but as you export value added products, um, a heavy tax is, um, is slashed on it. At the moment, there are no taxes on cocoa products into the EU market, but who knows, as Ghana strives to becoming a giant chocolate producer for the African market, possibly an attempt to export chocolate to the European markets could trigger some tariff escalation. But the good thing is that if um, Ghanaian chocolate makers are allowed to compete in Europe and North America with, um, with their chocolate, European consumers will have a good bite of um, chocolate with a higher cocoa content compared to what they are having um, at the moment. Um, and as I mentioned, um, 
we suggest utilizing the current marketing system to overcome some of these strategies. And I, I think I did so if you to the next slide, um, I'm already there, that's 24. Now I did mention um, the factory that was, the, the first factory that was set up um, in this country, which is in Takradi in the Western part of, of Ghana. The strategy that CMC and Cocoa Board deploys in this regard is that um, the CMC markets the products for these companies. And both these um, CPC, which is the Golden Tree brand, Cocoa Board is the majority shareholder in there. Um, but with the WAMCO, that's a West African Mills Company, Cocoa Board is a minority shareholder with, I think, 49% shares in there. Now, for these two companies, it has relieved them to some extent of the um, of their access to raw materials, which is the cocoa beans that they are supposed to buy with the USD. Again, um, in terms of their risk level as to how to manage their price risk and others, they leverage on the expertise of um, CMC, um, which is... Um, blessed with um, a group of well-trained traders. We've all been trained with some of these multinational companies and we do have industrial um, attachment with them on a regular basis. So for these two companies, as in the public companies with Cocoa Board participation in there, they have access to overseas markets using the expertise of, um, of CMC. Can this strategy be extended to other domestic processing companies? Yes, it can be done. But then, hey, this has to be at their call. If they think it's a need, then CMC and Cocoa Board can step in and say that, okay, um, we can sell your products forward so that we use those contracts as a collateral to extend to you credits on, on Cocoa Beans. So there's a strategy that... Um, that can be that can be looked at. Um, Sophie, so I've moved to the last slide. Okay, so we suggest extending the forward selling strategy to other private processing companies. Um, like niche cocoa processing, which is doing chocolates, like um, plots, enterprise, which is doing cake, possibly if they have access to, easy access to the raw materials, which is beans, it will also motivate them to process up to the chocolate level. Again, can there be a shift away from the annual syndication towards a system with um, where Cocoa Board finds, as I mentioned, the bond strategy, or possibly the government finds a way to give it a seed fund so that it relieves CMC and Cocoa Board from the annual um, syndicated loan. I mentioned earlier that we can leverage on the African continental free trade area as well as the ECOWAS free trade area to develop a chocolate industry to substitute imports. I mean, imports of chocolates into Africa is quite, um, is quite significant, especially to South Africa and the northern part of, um, northern part of Africa. Now, when, I mean, COVID-19 really tested to borrow offshore because, I mean, COVID-19 kind of shattered, really took a big hit. Um, because airports were, were shut, supermarkets were closed. Now, for anybody who has lost his, his income, chocolate wouldn't be the first thing to, to go by. So demand for chocolate really took a hit. And what it means is that um, the demand for cocoa beans from Ghana also, also softened. Now, as a result, Cocoa Board and CMC were not able to raise enough contracts in order to go for the offshore financing. And this presents a bigger challenge that 
um, extends back to the farmers. If Cocoa Board doesn't get easy access to financing, it implies that the license buying company that I mentioned from my maiden slide is that farmers cannot get ready access to cash. And there were instances where farmers have to pay, have to deliver their cocoa, but with no money to pay them. And this, um, this is unusual within the, within the Ghanaian sector. But COVID-19 presented a big challenge to the financing strategy of Cocoa Board. So maybe um, a strategy that relies less on the annual financing could be um, a good solution. And as I mentioned um, previously, such a strategy will give the Bank of Ghana more flexibility in, in, in terms of its access to, to foreign exchange on a monthly basis. On a monthly basis, Cocoa Board receives in excess of um, $200 million. Now, with the financing strategy, as in the offshore financing, if Cocoa Board goes for $1.5 billion, it starts repaying in, in February. So it uses about seven months maximum to repay the loan. What it implies is that all receivables between February and August or September are held up in the syndicated account to repay the loan. So the Bank of Ghana only gets access to the USD largely when Cocoa Board draws down the bigger amount, which is the loan. So if it is 1.5 billion or 2 billion, that comes in October and November, that's when the Bank of Ghana gets access to that money. Now, can they, would they manage it much better within a shorter window or when they have it steadily on a monthly basis? I believe is that a steady approach will be more appropriate. Again, we suggest greater independence between Cocoa Board and Bank of Ghana to avoid um, overselling in times of crisis. And lastly, we highly recommend um, a tax incentive for domestic artisanal chocolates in order to turn Ghana into Africa's domestic chocolate um, production hub. And I must mention the current management led by the chief executive. I think um, I don't remember the time we had a chief executive who has been very aggressive on, on, um, on promoting domestic chocolate production than we have now. And we are fortunate to have the African Continental Free Trade ahead of us being in Accra. So that could be a big push for Ghana to, to become Africa's um, chocolate production hub. Um, thanks so much for, for listening. Thank you very much, um, um, Fuat and Sophie, for these very insightful and interesting uh, presentation of uh, very thorough data collection um, um, and um, interesting findings and policy recommendations you make. There's a few questions that people posted to me uh, in a private message that um, uh, I first just share with you that were some of them were um, definitional questions. Um, uh, there was a question about the meaning of open interest in cocoa trade. And if you could briefly talk about what what does what that means, uh, open interest. Um, and then also in a private message it was shared that um, uh, or the question was if any local Ghanaian companies export cocoa butter or other byproducts? And if so, which countries do they primarily, prim primarily sell to? And what is the value of those exports? So um, rather than fully processed cocoa, uh, are, are there any byproducts that they sell to other countries? Um, and if so, which countries? Um, and yeah, and then also in the private message, it was asked in the short run, if Ghana redirects efforts and resources to improve cocoa processing in Ghana, wouldn't that in the long run uh, improve export opportunities and access to foreign currency? So basically, it would an upscaling um, to more sort of capital intensive uh, processing 
um, will also lead to an improvement of the local currency in terms of their hierarchy in the international currency hierarchy, if I understand that question correctly, because it would improve export opportunities um, uh, and, and thereby would make it more interesting um, for foreign investors. Um, as, as, much, as far as I understand this question correctly, please, uh, to the person who asked me the question in private, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so these three questions may maybe to start off with that were posted to me privately, and then we go into other questions that have been posted as well. Um, and in the meantime, as well, to anybody else, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask away. Right, shall I take the open interest one and you take the uh, the second one on um, what is being exported at what level of processing? I think Sarah also posed the question right. of um, what are the different uh, stages? So what is primary, what is secondary processing? Right. Yeah, okay, let me, so the open right, interest one is very simple. Shall I start with that one? Yep. Okay, so open yeah. interest is a term that is uh, associated with all um, futures trading. So futures are basically standardized contracts. So when Fjord was talking about forward selling cargo, uh, futures are the same thing, but they standardize contracts and or standardized versions of a forward contract and they're being traded on exchanges. So they have a clearing house, they have an exchange like the, uh, the ICE um, in London. Now, open interest is basically the number of contracts that are, are being traded. So if you have a contract, the contract is over a sad amount of cocoa beans or sad amount of uh, kilograms of cocoa beans. And you have a buy and a seller for each contract. It's being insured by something which is called the clearing house that every contract has a buyer and a seller. Now, open interest counts the number of contracts that are outstanding at any point in time. And you can compare this so if you say um, you have 100 kilograms per contract of cocoa beans and um, per contract, yeah, and you have 100 contracts, then you have 100 times 100 uh, kilograms of cocoa beans being traded at that particular exchange at that point in time. So you can compare this with the actual amount of cocoa that is being produced in every single year. And that's what the second graph, the graph on the right hand side um, shows you. So what are the amount of contracts, futures contracts that are being traded? Um, over a, uh, a particular amount of kilograms of cocoa beans compared to what is the actual amount of cocoa beans that are being produced in every single um, single year. That's what open interest is. Um, Fuad, over to you. Uh, hello? Okay. There was a question on the volume of, um, of exports as well as the value. Um, so as I mentioned in the presentation, Ghana exports um, or processes about, the maximum we have seen was 320,000 um, in 2019-20. Um, now, I must mention as well that the largest or the top non-traditional foreign exchange ENA for Ghana is processed cocoa. So whereas raw cocoa beans is the largest, um, is a key foreign exchange earner for the government of Ghana, the non-traditional exports, the top foreign exchange earner again is cocoa, processed cocoa, um, cocoa products, um, largely cocoa, um, cocoa, cocoa liquor, which is cocoa paste. And um, the vibe, I don't have the value um, at hand, but maybe I'll find that and later share it. Um, with the, with the team. Sarah asked, um, asked a question about what I mean by primary, secondary, and tertiary um, processing, if, I'm, if I got it correctly. By primary, so you have the cocoa beans, the first stage. And again, I will suggest that you take a look at the main paper that was published by the European Journal of Development Research, where we showed the stages in, um, in processing. By primary processing, we refer to just um, grinding the beans into chocolate paste. So it's just like grinding um, peanuts into, into peanut paste. And that's what we call primary. By moving further to press, so you press the paste to get butter, the butter, cocoa butter, which is the most expensive and the most cherished um, 
products it sells. So if cocoa beans is selling at $2,500, you could have um, butter selling above $6,000. There are times that butter reach about $8,000 to $9,000. And that's a major ingredient um, for, for chocolate for chocolate making. So by secondary, we mean um, pressing further the liquor into butter and cake bean is residual. Then by tertiary, processing further the butter into, into chocolate or the powder into beverages. I mean, we have quite a lot um, locally here. So that's, um, these are the, if, I think those are the questions um, that um, Toby read out, except if I missed, um, I missed something. No, I think I think that was correct. I think maybe maybe another question that is related to this is how um, these various levels of processing, and if I understood the question of, from Sada as well correctly, uh, are linked to the process of upgrading. So how can sort of a deepening maybe in the primary and secondary stages of processing help uh, maybe also the learning? And the learning processes along these uh, these levels of process uh, of processing uh, help with the upgrading into the tertiary um, levels and to more capital intensive pro um, processing stages. If I if I if I understand this question correctly, um, right. So I think um, Sophie um, in the on the first slide showed the value of the chocolate industry globally which is about 150 billion US dollars. However, because these um, West African producing countries largely export raw materials, they get um, less than 7% of that global value, even though we must admit that the 150 billion dollars isn't only for cocoa, other raw materials, um, milk, um, sugar, packaging, advertising and others. But then the most important chocolate ingredient is cacao. So it affects what can West African producers and government do to earn much more in the chain. And that's what the upgrading will achieve. Now, if Ghana exports 60% of its cacao as raw beans, why wouldn't it export 40% as raw process 60% locally? As I mentioned in explaining the um, tertiary um, processing values or pre, uh, secondary processing values. If the cocoa beans, raw cocoa beans sells at $2,500, a primary processing products in terms like liquor, which is cocoa liquor, sells around $3,200, $3,500. So that's value addition, both in terms of expertise, in terms of um, capital, and in terms of access to foreign exchange. The higher the, the participation in the chain, the more the foreign exchange and expertise being built within the local, the local market. And I must mention, there's an ambitious target by both Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire to process 50% of, um, of, their, of their cocoa output. At the moment, I think Cote d'Ivoire is the largest cocoa processing country in the world, um, and followed by, I think, Netherlands, but hey, Let's see what happens. Maybe Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire will become the, or West Africa will become both the cocoa production hub as well as the cocoa processing hub when we have Ghana Cote d'Ivoire processing more than 50% of, uh, of their annual output. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, Tobias, can I just follow up on this, on the one question I think we overlooked the first time around, which is the, that whether the medium value added products would not already stabilize foreign exchange earnings. So yeah. I just, it's just, it's complements what Fuad was, has just said. So um, if we look at the different stages, so uh, the raw cocoa beans, the liquor, cocoa uh, powder and cocoa butter, and then eventually chocolate. If you think about um, a particular chocolate bar that you really like and you buy it maybe every year since your childhood, think about how much this price has fluctuated over the years. Pretty little, I would assume. If you, however, and I probably should have included a, a figure on how global cocoa prices are, <laughs> are moving throughout the centuries. They're highly volatile. So the higher the level of processing you get, the less volatile. So it's not only the, the value addition that food has, has talked about uh, um, 
um, before, which exactly is also like our main focus, but the other focus is of course also moving away from having a very volatile um, foreign exchange earnings. And the higher le the level of processing, the lower the volatility there is. However, liquor is still priced as a reference against the raw beans, who would correct me if I'm wrong, while uh, butter and powder, they're usually also referenced as a ratio towards each other. So they're offsetting. Sometimes uh, uh, butter is more expensive and sometimes powder. So they still reference quite strongly against the raw cocoa bean price. So also quite volatile, while chocolate actually isn't volatile, um, that is, is less volatile. Forward, correct me there with the ratios. Um, yes, that is correct. And I must mention that um, you, yeah, you've hammered on the, on the right point. The less cocoa beans West African countries export, the lower the volume of beans available to the exchange. And what it means is that um, this can drive prices beyond the current levels. Right, that is true. Yeah, and I think that very much links also to a question that uh, uh, Carol in, posted in the, in the chat and also something that I wanted to put to you guys. Uh, Carol said, that if uh, this collateral role of COA is related to the US, if this is similar to what happens with other commodities and whether the, the diversification of the export pro exported products would help as a solution, basically in that collateral, what, what, what this collateral role of the US dollar, uh, co COCA is to the US dollars. And, and, and a similar question that, that, that was arising for me is that this vulnerability to price do this price fluctuation um, and to sort of diversify, are there any attempts to use the high earnings that Ghana has from the export of cocoa products and of cocoa to diversify their economies um, and how, whether or not sort of these natural resource rents or commodity rents are used in any attempts to diversify and go into more uh, high technology, maybe even industrial um, diversification. Where should um, I start? Yes. Or you, want to, you start, you okay, start. Okay, Sophie start. Okay, that's fine. So the question by, um, by, by Carol, um, yes. Um, <laughs> sorry. Unfortunately, that's, um, so I did mention the presentation that the structural adjustment program led to the um, dismantling of a lot of marketing boards, which cocoa was the only commodity board that was left standing. Everybody who has read about the development commodity trading within West Africa knows that West Africa used to have a lot of marketing boards for different commodities. As part of the World Bank structural adjustment program, most of these boards were dismantled. Cocoa we stu stood um, especially for Ghana. Now, that made it a bit difficult for the other sectors to benefit from these um, kind of collateral financing. But at the moment, what the government of Ghana has done is to set up what they call the Tree Development Authority, which looks at commodities like coffee, um, palm, cashew, share, share not share butter, where they will learn from the expertise or experience of cacao so that these products will also bringing um, foreign exchange for the country. So that's, um, that's, that's a strategy being, um, being looked at. Now, Toby asked a question um, of using the earnings from cocoa to diversify other sectors. I must mention, so when you speak to farmers, farmers, even if a farmer is um, 25 year old, he believes that the country is, indebt is indebted to him because the whole Ghanaian economy was built on cocoa, three independent. Most of the um, educational institutions, um, road infrastructure, the Ghana's um, petroleum refinery, most of these sectors were built on the back of cocoa revenues. And it continues to be the same. So Cocoa Board is a major road funder or financier within the Ghanaian um, sector. It provides scholarship to to wards of, um, of farmers. Um, there was a case where the government wanted to use rev cocoa revenue to develop the share sector. That has been a bit of, um, of a slow growth. 
but our expectation is that with the establishment of the tree development authority this suggestion um as mentioned by toby could be could be aggressively pursued yeah sophie um yes excellent um ghana is quite i mean as who had said ghana is quite uh proactive in not only with cocoa but also how to manage its revenues from oil and gold right so ghana is uh, a massive importer for for not so much for oil on the global scale but oil is a, has a big share in overall exports for ghana but it's uh, the largest uh, exporter of gold as well a uh, second large i think of gold and then uh the in um in the region and the uh, second largest of cocoa um so it is you could, one could argue it's diversified in terms of primary commodities however it's the problem is that all of these three commodities are highly volatile um and when gold uh, when oil was discovered which is a recent relatively recent addition from comparison to gold and uh, cocoa um there were several studies that showed kind of the typical dutch disease type of effect so absorbing this windfall gain uh, story has been uh, present as well and there are a couple of sovereign wealth funds that are being set up by the government um in order to to manage this which is kind of the um the guidance that's usually provided by uh the international financial institutions um so yeah and historically of course nakruma was uh, the one of the first ones who was a very vocal about industrialization after independence and using um commodity revenues in order to finance that uh, unfortunately there was a com commodity bust which then led to high indebtedness but that uh, is not uh, a new idea um I think Sarah asked a question about the uh, link between liberalization and financialization. Yes, um, I was also just going to come that as a last question. Um, uh, so yes, thanks for picking it up, Sophie. <laughs> um, okay, so I think um, as Fuad said, Ghana is very unique when it comes to, so it's the only country that hasn't liberalized its cocoa board. Um, as a result of this, the capabilities of producing high quality chocolate if you wouldn't have been preserved so the um, golden tree brand has been ex in existence since the 60s the brand name maybe not um, but the company that is producing um, that chocolate so capabilities have been there and they haven't been destroyed through liberalization they have been preserved and i think that's a massive benefit now for an emerging chocolate industry is because you have people who have the capabilities of actually producing chocolate so they know how it's, how it's being done both at the kind of uh, small very small small and medium level um and also large levels so niche is a it's a it's a very large uh um company um so that's something that has a preserved because it, the system well one could argue because the system wasn't fully um liberalized if you go to uh neighboring Cote d'Ivoire what you see is that what the actors that are the licensed called the licensed buying companies so these providers who buy the cocoa from farmers or um from uh local kind of purchasing clerks um in Ghana, they are a mix of so that some very, very few multinational companies have also registered licensed buying companies because these are the only the, the ones that are also active on the derivative markets because they only there, not because they can earn much money from it, but or uh, get much profit out of it, but they want to get the additional information advantage and control over the cocoa production. For, so for them, that's that's the only reason or one of the few reasons why they're there. Now, if you look at Cote d'Ivoire, that whole sphere is primarily dominated by multinationals. They're very, if any, actually, if it might know, um, uh, local uh, providers that are filling that role. Um, right. So that it's quite an imbalance. Fuad, yes, you, you will know better on that side. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's largely dominated by the by multinational companies. Yeah, so that's 90% dominated. Yeah, so that space has been preserved uh, for domestic providers in Ghana because of that um, not full uh, liberalization. When it comes to financialization, it depends on what kind of definition of financial. So we kind of gobbled together. So those who are familiar with the financialization literature have realized that we gobbled together quite a lot of different financialization traditions, um, also because that was the main theme of the special issue we were asked uh, to write. Um, but when it comes to 
um, the kind of shareholder value type of idea. Maybe it has, um, I don't necessarily think that has made a great difference in the sense how these, how even domestic companies or indigenous companies who grow now, if they want to compete internationally, they, I don't think they can avoid financialization to that extent, just because that's how companies are operating um, these days. Um, so yeah, mixed answer there, I think. Fuad, you might want to add something. You have the final word no, think, uh, before Tobias. Uh, no, I think um, you have you have answered it all. But one point I will um, mention: you did indicate um, oil. So one of the key strategies why the syndicated loan came into effect was to use cocoa revenue to support Ghana's um, oil imports back in 1992-93. Yeah, so whereas Ghana requires a lot of, even though um, since 2010, Ghana has become um, an oil exporting country, we still export quite a volume of um, processed or refined oil, I should say, um, for the local market. And in this mm -hmm. case, both the private sector and um, the government requires a lot of um, foreign exchange for that um, for that purpose and cocoa plays a very key role but um, in summary what we seek to say is that yeah the system is challenged but there are solutions where the domestic um, processing industry can be upgraded to participate highly in the value chain and also allow the government of um, or the bank of ghana which is ghana central bank to have access to cheaper financing through cocoa Okay, um, thank you very much to both Sophie and Fuad for a very insightful presentation um, and answering all the questions very thoroughly. And also thank you to everybody who, um, who was here today, um, participated actively, asked you questions. Um, and just quickly before we go, um, just to signpost it in two weeks time, uh, Mushtaq, Professor Mushtaq, Mushtaq Khan from our department will uh, present on feasible anti-corruption strategies and will more generally present on the work of uh, the SOAS um, ACE project. Um, so please join in on the 16th of June at 5 p.m. Um, the, the details can be found on our departmental website. Um, in, in the meantime, enjoy the summer and hopefully it will stay warm um, we still have a few hours of sunlight uh, to catch now. Um, so thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Sophie and Fuad, um, and everybody for joining. Until next time, uh, goodbye from, from all of us at the Economics Department at SOAS. Thank you for having us.